For all new and current subscribers, welcome back to Resilient Love. Resilient is being able to overcome difficult situations. This podcast is about love, love tips, tips on, on life, life, and how to level up in your business. Let's, Let's get, get started, started on, on the journey. journey. Hey everyone, we are back with another episode of Resilient Love. We have been speaking heavily about the events that have taken place in our country through our Juneteenth series. This episode, this episode in the series is called Living While Blue. We have our former chief of police with us today, Mr. Alonzo James. How are you doing today, sir? I'm great. How are you two doing? Good. good. Thank you good, so good. much. <laughs> yeah, congratulations on the show and on the marriage. I am so, so happy for you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> we would like to take this time to thank you for joining us. And before we jump into the matter, tell us a bit about yourself and your background. So um, I'm 25 years in law enforcement. Um, I started with the Durham Police Department. I uh, started on patrol, uh, did about seven years on patrol. Within four years, I was a, a corporal. Uh, basically, that's a, an entry-level supervisor position. And after seven years, I went into investigation. So um, off and on, I, I did SVU, I did homicide, I did armors, uh, armed robbery task force and squad. So um, spent just about half of my career in investigations. I uh, made it up the ranks to the rank of captain, and I uh, managed District 1, which is East Durham. And after that, I left and went to the Chapel Hill Police Department, where I served as assistant chief of police and stayed there for about three years. And then I came to your city of Kinston, where I was your chief for three years. And uh, so every every part of that career has just been uh, exciting. Um very um, educational for me. And I just had so many great mentors who just held my hands and exposed me to a lot of uh, great things about just life in general, management, and, you know, treating people the way you want to be treated. Yes, yes. that's good. So, so what inspired you to be a police officer? Because we titled this Living Wild Blue. And although you're a black man, when you put on that uniform, when you did, you, everybody saw you as blue. So what inspired you to even go into law enforcement? So I was broke. No, no, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I had three uncles and uh, probably about six cousins in the profession. So just... Growing up watching my uncle, who was the patriarch of the family, he uh, was, if not the first, one of the first uh, black detectives in the Raleigh Police Department. And I saw him, he inspired me. Um, I saw how the family really respected that position. Yeah. And um, just the job itself, the more I learned about it, initially I went to school to be an accountant and some coworkers said, Hey, that's not you. You're a social person. You're going to be bored out your wits. And they couldn't have been uh, telling me anything further from the truth. So uh, the more I learned about the profession of police and the more excited I got. And then the, the other part of it was I knew I wanted to serve our community. I had some, a few, not many bad experiences with law enforcement. And I just, I knew going into the profession that I was going to be, you know, I wasn't going to be that guy. I was going to be the guy that tried to help as much as I can and make a difference. Yes. Yes. And we can attest to that uh, <laughs> from you, your leadership you. in yeah. Kinston. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you. So as it, we go into our next, our third question is, um, so, you know, with everything going on in this society today, we wanted to have a police officer's perspective and even better you are a former chief of police walk us through how you have been dealing with the events that have taken place across the country wow that that's a very good question um i will say that is very complicated as well um mm -hmm. for me being retired it makes it 
challenging and easy because easy where I, it's easy for me to look on the outside to be honest with you and say wow what is going on uh, because I don't have the pressures of a chief anymore so like your your chief in Kingston now chief chief Gill Day uh, my heart goes out to him because I know it's a challenging time mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing now uh, I can tell you at least as early as 2014 are things that I was trying to push when I was in Chapel Hill with my chief and we made strides. And when I came to Kenston, we made strides. So there definitely needs to be police reform, no question about it. Uh, the, the challenges are uh, numerous. There are a number of challenges. First, there, is, there are under 18,000 law enforcement agencies in this country, close to 18,000. So every chief, every sheriff, they they kind of manage the way they see fit. You're going to find some leaders who say, I want um, a hands-on approach. I really want to tackle crime. You're going to find some leader, leaders who say, we really need to connect with the community. And then you're going to find a little of both. Um, so those are the challenges. Yeah. The, the other challenge is the trust. Um, you can't expect people to obey the law if they don't respect the people who's charged with enforcing the law. So my take has always been, you know, establishing that trust. And, and that means not charging for everything, uh, things that you could give someone a pass on. Mm -hmm. And in fact, giving passes sometimes will build in or enhance those relationships. So again, it's a loaded, it's a loaded question. There are so many working parts. <laughs> It's a good question and needs to be answered because there are so many layers to police reform. The other challenge is that uh, if, a, if an officer does something in California now with social media, uh, officers in Durham or Raleigh or Kinston are being judged for those actions. And yeah. so one of the things I will tell you in North Carolina, like you hear um, – ban chokeholds. You hear, don't put your knee on the, the a suspect or someone's neck. Those are things that in North Carolina, they were doing before I even became a police officer. When I was in the academy, I recall them saying that, you know, we don't do chokeholds unless it's a life or death situation. So um, when you hear people say police reform and they, they touch on the surface with chokeholds and, and things of that sort, mm -hmm. they really don't know the how complicated that is because every agency many agencies are already have already banned or prohibit those um those procedures right that's good, so, yeah, that's a good yes point. yes and and the other part of it is there are um national organizations like the inter well international international association of chiefs of police the police executive research forum um uh what was the other organization the um uh, organization of Black Law Enforcement, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, and they have already presented these recommendations years ago about de-escalation. And so those were the things, you know, when I came to Kinston and myself with the executive staff said, hey, we're going to embrace best practices. So those, those practices aren't new. What you're hearing is just that some agencies just have not embraced them at this particular time. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a really good point. Like just how, I mean, it's 18,000 agencies, you know, and, yeah. and so that's a lot of leaders. That's a lot of opinions. That's a lot of, as you already stated, different, you know, protocols, so, yeah. I mean, it, it really does take us coming together as a community. And again, I have to give kudos where kudos is due because you were very active in community engagement and involvement and always being an advocate for conversation. So, yeah. And we had an interview with a gentleman from that lives in China and he was mm -hmm. saying that it, again, internationally, they they do de-escalation with conversation. So, Absolutely. yeah, yeah. Only a few parts of that country have guns. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good well, point. I really like that. That That is true. And so um, I attended a presentation from the Police Executive Research Forum. 
I want to say back in 2015, and they did studies with other countries uh, around the world. And you're right, their de-escalation is really a top priority there. And so I think you all, rec you may recall when the mayor of Atlanta gave a press conference uh, about the incident with uh, Mr. Brooks. And she said it, there's a difference with what, you, with what you can do and what you should do. And so yeah. that's another challenge. So the standard of what officers can do and I understand that standard because we have a split second. I'm saying we, but they have a split second right. to make a life or death um, decision. And so if they make that wrong one, uh, you talk about qualified immunity. But at the same time, there, there are incidents where we could have taken a lighter approach just because I'm justified in tasing someone maybe if i talk a little longer i can talk them down you know so yeah. that that's the mindset in other countries but i will also say too our country there are ex access to weapons and things that you won't hear from those other countries so right. that's why i'll tell you it's, it's just not an easy answer on on the surface it, it is great to say let's change that standard but then when you look at other, you know, countries, they don't have the challenges with yes. people having access to weapons like they do in the United States. So that's so you're right. You're right. I, I mean, that you summed it up really good. I mean, it is going to take us going through each layer of the yeah. law, each layer. The law has layers because like yeah. you said, in one instance, it will be okay, and another, it's not. So it has layers for sure. And it's it's just not it's not just the law enforcement. It's the law enforcement working with government hand in hand to restructure things from as they were. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So, Indeed. um, so that leads us to our advice question, which you really kind of hit it, but take it one step further. What advice do you have? for those who are serving in the law enforcement currently, and then what advice do you have or, or words of encouragement do you have for citizens that may be living in fear when they see the blue lights? Yeah. Those are good questions. So I'll start with the citizens. Uh, no, I can tell you from working in three agencies, without a doubt, the majority of the men and women who put on that uniform, they, they've come to work trying to make a difference. And, they do need that support. I will tell you because I think about it and I'm, I'm thinking like, wow, the, the depression's kicking in. Um, I have colleagues that I speak to on a regular basis and they're telling me about, you know, officers are really right now, you know, because they, they are portrayed as a whole as the bad guys. And so mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, I can say, keep your head up. I can say, uh, seek counseling if needed. I can say all those things, but I'm not the person on the line anymore. So I have to be mindful and say it's easy for me to say that. But what I said to the citizens is, you know, know that the majority of the officers come to work really trying to help and they just want to serve. And, and if you, nine times out of 10, if you, you know, are um, showing them respect, being, you know, cordial, they will be cordial too. Of course, there are always, you know, other circumstances. So I'm not, you know, shutting down the concerns of the community by any means. Uh, how do we tackle this? Again, that's a very complex, um, complicated question with a lot of layers. I know that right now for the first time in a long time, you know, people who felt like they were never being heard are, you know, they have the floor. That's so, so true. That is true. So I would, I would say as chiefs and sheriffs, um, I would really look at my African-American minority and women, um, people of color, officers, and I would really gauge them because no community is alike. And so what, the, what they're experiencing in Durham is very different than what you all are experiencing in Kansas. So your, your people of color who are in the police department can give you a lot of guidance if they are very truthful and say, hey, this is what we need to do. Here's my take on the community. And we really have to gauge them. Yeah. Um, the other thing I will say is, um, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? Sorry about no, that. No, 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 go, keep flowing, keep flowing. Oh, I was just <laughs> going to say the other part is the, the implicit bias piece of it, where we do, everyone 
everyone, and I've said this at a community meeting, we judge people by the way they look, by their backgrounds. That's it's human nature. Yeah. That doesn't mean we're mean people, we're bad, but we every agency should be really touching on implicit bias. And I can tell you in all three agencies we did that. I'm I'm proud of it. But there's still so much work to do on it. Um and then I will I will say you, you should look at your policies because there are policies that dispor- disproportionately impact certain communities. And so you may have a policy where um, I'm trying to off the top of my head where you go into certain communities and you're very um, assertive when it comes to police actions. Well, let's be honest, you know, there is only a certain group of people who are going to suffer from that. And the same people who are asking for you to serve and protect them end up nine times out of 10 are the ones getting charged. And I can tell you from personal experience, when I was a captain in Durham, I am guilty of it, no no doubt about it. And it took a wake-up call going to a community meeting and hearing from the citizens and saying, wow, you know, we asked for help, but we felt like we were being held hostage. So mm. that was a wake-up call for me. Mm. So we have to really look at those policies. And the other thing I would say, we, we really need that national database. And you, I think y'all heard that from politicians from people in the um in in this movement they're saying hey coach truth be told i could commit a crime or i could get fired in north carolina for misconduct your certification is state certified so i can't be the police in any city in north carolina however i could go to texas and then take a job as a law enforcement officer or go you know to south carolina or tennessee so if you had a national registry, then you could keep track of that misconduct. And going back to the, the national standards that I talked about uh, from those organizations, everyone should be embracing those national standards. And I can tell you there are probably so many other things we could be doing. I don't have all the answers, but um, I, something else just came to me as far as we really have to pay our officers. I know we're talking about you hear people say be fun but just like with the community the more educated you are the more trained the better trained you are the more likely you are to try to resolve issues in a diplomatic way that's just the way it is and so if you spend more funding on training and educating and studies have even shown officers with college degrees are more than likely uh, or more able to de-escalate situations. Yeah. And so See, if you're educating them, then they're more likely to talk things through um, and be open. And I'm not slamming anyone who doesn't have a college degree, trust me, um, because some people get offended when I say this, but bottom line is an education is not just about that degree. It, it's about being open. And when you're when you're college educated, you are a little more open to other sides and opinions. So. Yeah. I, I just wanted to touch on what you were saying. I think that maybe, you know, it's, it's very important that maybe a lot of law enforcement agencies promote more education within, you know, with officers mm-hmm. getting not just degrees, but also just continuous training. It's almost like, um, dealing with kids in elementary mm-hmm. i give you a piece of candy you give me you, you know it's it's <laughs> yeah and you know educators just for a side note educators because i'm in the education field we're always <laughs> in somebody's professional <laughs> development you yeah. know and it's like people it, we make the joke in the education world okay i'm tired of pd but you know the pd helps you in some capacity whether you're the first year or the 10 year something is said or it's just a reminder you know and i yes. feel like like you already mentioned if the law enforcement agencies continue pd and i mean for real pd it's mm-hmm. either reminders or you're learning something new yeah that, that's a very good point and, and i will tell you in north carolina there's a great deal of like we call it in-service training where okay. they are being exposed every year like you said on, um, on professional development but those incentives or ways to send them back to college or 
um, higher learning, I think, is very beneficial. Every officer doesn't embrace it. Every agency can't afford to, though. But I will tell you, because some agencies, uh, Durham, for instance, you couldn't reach a certain rank. You had to have an associate's degree before you were a lieutenant. You needed a four-year degree before you were a captain. And That's there's good. pushback to that to a degree. And I understand why there's pushback. But then you look at other some other agencies, you just can't afford to do that. And your pool is, is really smaller. So if you were to say you can't be a captain unless you have a four-year degree, you may only have one or two people who are qualified. And so that those are those challenges I was talking about earlier because the big cities have a lot of flexibility where the average agency out of those under 18,000 agencies I talked about, the average one has an, a, a probably less than 35 persons in their police department. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about a small agency. And so it's, it's they don't have the resources that a uh, New York City or Charlotte may have. That's so good. Yeah, yeah. Look, the size does matter. <laughs> the budget, <laughs> the budget matters. <laughs> um. So, so yeah, I'm glad we're laughing about that, and you have really educated us on some things. And so, thank you, because your years of experience have really brought just a light of clarity and a light of understanding of how it is from a law enforcement perspective. But I want to switch it up because people are probably wondering, okay, Chief, what you up to now since you retired? <laughs> so so how has life changed? That's our question. How has life changed since you retired? Um, I will tell you the first maybe two or three weeks, it was, it was hard. <laughs> <Just because laughs> I've, I've been a police all my adult life, and so... I miss it. I really love the profession. I really do. And uh, I felt like I was like making a difference, uh, regardless of how small of a difference, I felt like I was. And so I miss that. I miss the people. Uh, but I have so many friends and family who constantly reached out to me. That was definitely refreshing. Um, but life has been pretty good. I, um, I'm connect connected with training officers through police academies when they first coming in to the field, um, doing leadership consulting. And I, um, everyone who knows me closely know that music is my first love too. I'm a big hip hop head. So uh, I, I actually put out a, a single recently in the next three weeks, my entire album will be out too. So that's what I'm up to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so, Get into the album, like I, we heard the single and it's fire. But thank you, thank you, you. you talk to everybody about the the vision behind the music. So um, I started working on this like right when I re retired. It's for eight the past eight months, I've been recording. Uh, a close friend of mine is a producer, and what I wanted to do, uh, the art my my artist name is Chief of Police, and the name of the album is Highest Ranking Officer. Uh, the, the first single that you were referring to is called Witness Protection, but I wanted to give my perspective, first of all, as a, a man of God, uh, as a, a, a black male, and as a police officer, and how the being a, man, a person of color and a, a police officer can compete with one another, but also, hey, this is my perspective on life. So um, in my album, I'm talking about, hey, and community empowerment, saying, hey, you have to, you know, empower yourselves and say we're not going to tolerate certain things in, the, in your community. But I'm also talking about police reform. I'm talking about criminal justice reform, domestic violence, just things that are just dear to me. And, and you know, and, and trying to be as transparent as possible, saying, hey, I get it. I understand that as a police officer, here, here are my eyes. This is what I've seen. Doesn't mean that I was right all the time. And so I'm, I'm just trying to be speaking from the heart and being as honest as I can on the album. And so I just, I hope people, when they hear it, understand that uh, it's very truthful. Even the stories that I talk about from uh, some, some homicides, from some just experiences that I've had on my first uh, day as an officer. I was involved in a, a ride, and I'm just really trying to be wow. 
as transparent and real as possible. Yeah. Wow. I mean, we could open up a whole book <laughs> yeah. on this uh, Alonzo James. Like, wow. Those 25 years have really just, I know, transformed, but also gave you a perspective of just community. I know you're yeah. a community oriented individual. I know you're family oriented, you know, and so that your just your experience as a whole has helped us. And even though you're a black man and you used to live blue, you will yeah. always be with the blue family. I know for sure. So um, do you have any other questions? I guess uh, I was just kind of like, why she didn't let me in on that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, when I when I heard it, I was like, I didn't know he had this in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. So by last year, I promoted a gospel um, rap concert and partnered with The Gate. And we had a pretty good turnout. And then maybe a few months after that, uh, they asked me to participate in their, they had a talent show. And so I did do like one song for everyone right before I left. And uh, I did actually, to be honest with you, that's what inspired me to say, man, I still feel that love for, for hip hop and for music. Let me just go ahead and I have something to say. And so uh, I didn't tell a lot of people until I, I wanted the project to be done because if you hear someone say, I'm a police chief and I rap, you're like, yeah, whatever, you know? So <laughs> I said, the proof is in the pudding. Let me put it out and then let people hear it. And, you know, a lot of times I sent it, uh, sent a link to people and then say, hey, this is me, just so I could get some really, really honest feedback. So. <laughs> yeah, when you when you sent it to us, I, I was like, oh, okay, you sent me a song. And I said, hold on, that's cheap, man. <laughs> but it was so good. So, guys, we're going to have the link in the description box. For you to go listen to his first single, one of his singles, Witness Protection, is so good. I hope that you all go and get the album in the next three weeks. And um, Chief, I'm always call you Chief, but we appreciate <laughs> you and we had we enjoyed this conversation. And maybe Likewise. we can talk again. Anytime, you just let me know. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. look, this has been another episode of Resilient, Resilient Love. Love. Check y'all later. Thanks so much for listening to Resilient Love Podcast. We wanted to take this opportunity to also let you know that you can help us by committing to a monthly fee of $0.99, cent, $2.99, or $9.99. Those contributions help us to keep this movement of resilient love going. Blessings to all listeners and subscribers. Thank you all. Resilient, Resilient love. love.